Well, today I am thrilled that we'll be taking communion together. And uh, the title of the message is The Great Exchange. But first, let me give you a fun story about a, an exchange that may not have been so great. I heard about this young man who was a huge, addicted football fan. And every year, for many years, he would buy tickets in advance to the Super Bowl and fly to wherever it's being held because that was just his yearly thing. Well, he splurged one year for two Super Bowl tickets at $2,000 a ticket, not realizing that it was actually going to be on the same day as his wedding. He didn't know what to do, so he put an ad in Facebook and uh, asking if anyone would like to go in his place. And so the ad read, the time will be three o'clock in the afternoon, Cornerstone Baptist Church. Her name is Tiffany. <laughs> well, I don't know if that went too well, that exchange. But today we're gonna visit another more appropriate exchange as we take communion. My prayer is that today's message will actually unlock the Old Testament for you. If you catch this, it will unlock the whole sacrificial system and you'll catch it from the beginning to the end. You'll go, I got it, I got it. As we take communion, as I said, the Lord, the scriptures don't say you have to take it every Sunday or every week or every month. It just simply says, as oft as you take it. The goal is remember me. Don't do it as something perfunctory, as just something that becomes normal and forgotten and it becomes something very shallow and pale. But it has to be something that means a little bit. So that we, go, we ratchet back to Calvary and we understand this whole thing about the sacrifice because that can get pretty weird when you hear about the Jewish sacrifices and the, that they do every year, you know, with the bulls and the lamb. You think, oh, I don't know. One thing I need you to understand is that when God would speak to people in whatever era that they were living in, God would always speak to them in the culture that they understood. There's no use them speaking to God speaking to Abraham in 2022 culture and lingo and language. It wouldn't make sense, nor would he speak to you with a culture that was vastly different. He, he speaks to you and me in the language that we understand, in the society that we understand, and he works and weaves everything into that because God wants to communicate. He just doesn't want to dictate. So he's going to speak to Abraham in a culture that he understood about what was going to happen in the future and a whole sacrificial system that was about to unfold. He called a man named Abram, which means a respected father. He later changes his name to Abraham, which means the father of a multitude of nations because his descendants or his tribe would go all over the world. Why? Well, you see, in those days, you didn't have armies or, or municipalities or cities or nations. You had tribes. And every tribe was its own, had a law unto itself. And usually the tribe would be run by, overseen by the patriarch, the father of uh, these the tribe of sons and daughters. And that's why in those days they would actually have not only wives but several wives because they had to accelerate their tribe for protection. And one tribe would war against another tribe because again, you didn't have cities, you didn't have governments, you had tribes. So Abraham was going to have a tribe. But at first when God said, you're gonna be the father of many nations, he said, I don't even have a kid yet. I'm in trouble, I'm gonna, I'm roadkill. And you're sending me from Ur of the Chaldees all the way down here to Israel and I have nobody, I'm it. Me and my wife, and she don't shoot a gun very well. So we're in trouble. Well, God gives him a promise and says, I'm going to change your name to Abraham because you're going to have many nations. Well, in those days, when one tribe wanted to extend their rule or extend their land holdings, the only way to extend and gain more land is through war, tribal wars. And so one tribe would see another and they would attack 
and they would basically slay everybody. It was, it was carnage. It was pretty bad back then. And it was all swords and hatchets. I mean, it was pretty cruel back then. But they would wipe out everybody from that tribe. And then they would take over their camels, their donkeys, etc., and their land. And then they would go again to the next tribe. Well, when they would take a tribe, and I'm going to draw some things here for you. When they would take a tribe and wipe them out, a lot of times some of them would surrender. So here's what the king would do. This would be the king here. Here's his crown. And uh, so this is the king. And when he would take a, a tribe, he would have some survivors over here. Men, women, children, some, you know, some survivors. But basically, he would have slain all the rest. So here's what he would do. If the king were benevolent at all, he would draw a line. Now, this would be about the size of a football field or two. So it's a very huge area. And he would, now, sorry, the carnage here is going to increase, but he would take all of the people, all of the warriors that they had slain, and he would line them up here, pile their bodies up over here. So it would look like a pretty bloody gauntlet here. Then the king would have his entourage and all of his regalia over here, all of his warriors, and they would stand there. Now then the king would get maybe a, some kind of a secretary or a communicator, and this person would come out and read all of the stipulations of this new kingdom that these people here can be a part of if they do exactly what these commandments of this king says. So these people listen, and these people would, this one would say, hear ye, hear ye, hear ye, here's the commandments of this new tribe. Now, after it's all been read, if these people say, okay, we will abide by it, then they would have to walk through this bloody gauntlet when one of these men here would say, and remember, if any of you breaks any of these commandments, you will become like these people on the sides. Do you understand? And they say, yes, then walk. But remember, if you break any of these commandments, it is a one-strike rule, you're done. We kill you. Because actually, you should all be dead right now. But we're going to give you a second chance. And when you come across this line and stand here, you are now slaves of this king. Now, if the king is mean, they became slaves. If the king is benevolent, they would become servants of the king. But the king would take care of them, but they're still servants. But they understand that they're under the jurisdiction of what they agreed to, this command. So now they are new citizens, no longer old. Everything is new, but they're servants of the king. And this is what will happen to you if you disobey any of these commands. Now, if this person said, no, I'm not going to do that. No, I'm not going to work for you. Then these people would come and slay them and put their bodies over here. So it was extremely graphic. Now, if you came across this gauntlet and you came across this line, you would never forget what you saw. That bloody carnage would be burned into your mind. And so when you come across, you know that there's a different set of commands. And if you disobey, you die. Got it. Well, Abraham understood this because... This, this is the culture in which he lived. So now God in Genesis chapter 15 has a very interesting scenario in Genesis 15. So if you will take out your notes, we're going to read 
what it says here in the book of Genesis. And then you'll begin to understand. Now, there's something called a suzerain treaty. A suzerain is an overlord or a king. So a suzerain covenant is what you just saw. Abraham knew that. It was well known in his area of what would take place should one tribe take over another. And with that in mind, in Genesis 15, you're going to see a kind of a cryptic uh, story here, but we'll explain it and you'll see that it makes a lot of sense. At the top of your notes and on the screen, let's see what the Lord says to Abram just before he changed his name to Abraham. Would you read it with me? Go. The Lord said to Abram, bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all of these to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves on either side, just like we saw there. Continue. The bird, oh, sorry, on opposite of each other. Continue. Then birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. As the sun was, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. And when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, watch this, a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram. Now here's what's taking place. Abram is called from Ur of the Chaldees down. And God says, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. So here's Abram here, standing. And God says, I want you to take some bulls, some goats, and, I, and lambs, and I want you to cut them in half. Now, this is going to get gross, so forgive me. So he would chop these up and put like the head over there. This is the filet mignon. I'm going to put it closer to me <laughs> and the brisket and stuff. And so, so he takes now a goat and he chops up a goat. Do you see how bloody this is getting right now? Sorry, lunch is next. And then he takes a sweet little lamb and cuts and hacks that thing up. And so it becomes extremely visual. And he takes another goat and cuts it and hacks it up and puts it over here. Now, God says to Abram, you understand the suzerain covenant. You are going to leave your country and you're going to come under my rulership. And I'm going to give you commands. And I'm going to give you commandments. And I'm going to give you ordinances. And I'm going to give you statutes. And I want you to be willing to leave the Ur, the Chaldees, and all that you used to think. And I want you to come under my tutelage and my rulership. The Bible says that Abram then could not make that trek through this bloody gauntlet because he knew that if he broke one of God's commandments, he would immediately die. And so the Bible says all day he stood there because he was reticent. He was wringing his hands. He says, no way. I can't do this. I know I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess up. I would be cut in half in a week. I can't keep all of that. I'm not perfect. I'm going to make a mistake. And so he was wringing his hands all day. Birds of the air came on these carcasses and he shooed them away and then went back over here and said, I can't do it. I can't do this. Because I know that if I walk here and stand here, I break one of God's covenants. I'm dead meat. In fact, the Bible says the wages of sin is... Yeah. So he understood that. So I can't do it. All day passed. Afternoon came. The sun. And then it started to get dark. He couldn't make that walk. He couldn't make that covenant. He couldn't make that promise. I can't do it. 
The Bible says it this way. So when evening came, there appeared something like a smoking oven and a what? A flaming torch. And as he's standing here, something of a flame and smoke began to go through this. Do you remember in the Exodus, God led his people with a cloud by day and fire by night. So watch this. God knew that Abram and God knew that we could not keep all of his covenant because if we do, we would die. So you know what God did? God said, you know, I'm going to make a covenant with myself because in the original, you sin, you die. But you can't do that. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And listen, now the covenant is this. If you sin, I die. And I will make that covenant for you because I love you. And you sin, I die. Abraham couldn't understand that. He said, what? That's a love that I can't understand. That's a king whose heart for me I can't understand. Uh huh. But this is what I want you to do. Now here comes step two. In the Jewish sacrificial system, every year was something called the Day of Atonement. They would take bulls and goats and they would sacrifice them and put them on the altar like this. And they would ask God for forgiveness. And it was pretty bloody if they're doing a sacrifice like that. In our culture, we'd go, no way. But in their culture, that's what they did. What was God saying? God was saying, when you have that day of atonement and you sacrifice animals, I want you to remember the high priest is going to be asking for forgiveness for your family. You bring a goat, you bring a lamb, you bring a bull, and we sacrifice. And when it's pretty bloody, you will look at it and you will say, that should be me. Uh-huh. Because the original is you sin, you die. But there's going to be a substitutionary sacrifice or a sacrificial system so that we will substitute another sacrifice for your sins. The blood of bulls, or the blood of goats, etc. And when you see that, you as a dad and yours your family and that's your lamb that they slain, that they slayed, the priest will turn and say, that should be you. We know, but that's a substitute. We're grateful. And they pray for forgiveness. This would happen again and again throughout the years so the Jewish people would understand that that should be us for the wages of sin is. But we couldn't keep that going. So a day came where the Bible says, that but God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. In other words, God himself laid aside his crown and glory and took off his regal robes and became a swaddling, a baby with swaddling clothes. All God, but all man. He was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. So that when John the Baptist saw Jesus in the distance, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. <gasps> oh, so you mean the promise of God is going to be fulfilled according to the law? Uh-huh. That's why Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill the law. You sin." God dies. What? Yeah. And that's why we find here in the scriptures, and let's read this next scripture together, and it'll start to come together for you. Would you read out of Romans chapter 8? It says this. Read it. Go. God did what the law could not do. God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us. That's the great exchange. We sin, Jesus dies. That's the love of God for you and for me. And by his blood, we have entry 
into eternal life now by grace and by forgiveness. And that's why God calls us to himself through Jesus Christ and the blood of his son gives us forgiveness of sin. So when we take communion, that cup is the blood, as it were, the blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins. That bread is his body that was broken for you and for me. And so communion becomes a remembrance. Ah, that's what it's all about. So through the years, the Jewish people would have these yearly sacrifices and they would say, that's, that should be me. But God did a substitution for that so that I can live. And then when Jesus the Messiah comes, he doesn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And so God's promise is now completed. In fact, let's read the next scripture, Hebrews chapter 10. Would you read it? Go. The sacrifices serve year after year to remind people of their sins. For the blood of bulls and goats can never take away sins. For this reason, when Christ was about to come into the world, he said to God, you neither want nor are you pleased with sacrifices and offerings or with animals burned on the altar and the sacrifices that take away sins. He said this even though all these sacrifices were offered according to the law. Then he said, here I am, O God, to do your will. So God does away with all the old sacrifices and puts the sacrifice of Christ in their place. So when Jesus came as the Lamb of God, he then was the sacrificial lamb that satisfied the law from the very beginning. And through his blood and through his sacrifice, we have entrance into the kingdom. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, 2 Corinthians says, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And Jesus then is crucified for us. And that's why Galatians 2.20 says it this way. For I have been crucified with Christ. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. And so now through grace, we are now in a dispensation or the New Testament of grace and forgiveness because of a loving king who sent his son to die for us. So how do we remember that? Each time we take communion, we remember him. It is by grace that we are saved through faith and that not our, of ourselves, lest any man should boast. So now these scriptures are starting to make sense. Ah, now I'm getting it. Now it's not just some Jewish tradition of sac. It was for them to remember that that should be me. And then Jesus comes and dies for us. And so when we take communion, we remember him. How many of you are glad that Jesus is faithful and he is a sacrifice for our sins? Boy, I am. So today we're going to take communion together. And we're going to say, Lord, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you. Because really, we should be dead. I mean, even if I asked you right now, how many of you have gone through an accident or something or a medical setback and you, should be, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't be alive today? But we are. And the rest of us, we should be dead because of the sins. For the Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But God, instead of, of allowing death to happen, he gives us entrance into a new kingdom with a new king who loves us so much. Oh, how grateful we are. So each time we take communion, we get to say thank you for your faithfulness. In a moment, we will. But for now, we're going to listen to a song. And ushers, would you prepare at this time? You're going to receive a cup that has a wafer on top and some juice underneath it and it's got some uh, a cover on it. And so if you would hold on to it, don't open it because you'll need some instructions, otherwise it'll go all over you. But uh, just hang on to it and there'll be a beautiful song sung and then we'll come back and we'll take communion together. But first we're going to pray. 
Lord, as we prepare our hearts to take communion, it's a communion with you, our loving King, our Heavenly Father. That you gave a promise to Abraham, the father of our faith, in a way that he understood. And then thank you, Lord, for sending your own son, that you emptied yourself and became a man and offered yourself up even to death on a cross that we might live. But that your laws would be fulfilled and now we receive grace forgiveness and entrance into your kingdom. So now we come under your laws, the word of God, for that is now the highest law in the land. For we're not in a man's kingdom, we're in your kingdom. We're a people of the kingdom of God on this earth. But Lord, we are under your jurisdiction, your covering and your love. And as we take communion, we're reminded and we remember that. So would you renew that to our hearts? Thank you for the sacrifice that you had for us. We thank you for that as we prepare our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. It was on the cross that one of the very last things Jesus said was in Aramaic. He said, to tell us thy, and then bowed his head. The word to tell us thy actually is a banker's word. When you pay your bill in full, they stamp it to tell us thy. Because the translation is paid in full. And so when Jesus said it is finished, it actually was a banker's term. It is paid in full. Sacrifice for your sin and mine. So because it's paid in full, we've got to go to the one who paid it so that he can apply his death to our account, his riches to our poverty. Even though it's there, if we don't come to him, we waste it. So he gives us the choice. Although it's paid, the next choice is yours. See, Jesus made his choice 2,000 years ago. The next choice is yours. If you haven't received Christ, make that choice today. And as you take communion, you can say, Lord, thank you for paying for my sins because I should pay for my sins. But you did. And I receive your grace and forgiveness. And communion remembers that. As you take communion, uh, I'm going to ask you to take, first of all, a transparent cover off. There's two covers, as it were. So one is lavender and the other is a transparent one. When you take the transparent one, you'll take out a wafer like this, and that'll be the first thing we'll take in just a second. And then carefully hold on to this as you take off the second one. If it goes crazy, you'll wear it home. <laughs> in the day that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after having given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which has been broken for you. As oft as you take it, remember me. And in like manner, after he had supped, he took the cup. And after having given thanks, he said, this is the blood of the new covenant, the covenant of grace, shed for you and for the forgiveness of sins. As oft as you take this, remember me. As we take communion today, would you remember that he shed his blood and died for you and me so that we could have life eternal? And it's by coming to Christ that we receive that benefit that the Father, a loving King, has offered to us, that we leave the old and we come into the new. We leave the world and say we come into your kingdom. That's a choice God offers to every single person. There's a ton more out there that we want to offer. He wants to offer that too. And we as a church want to continue to not only receive his word, but through us his word be given. To receive his grace, but through us his grace be given. To receive his forgiveness, but also through us his forgiveness can continue. That's called the bride of Christ, the church of the living God, people of the kingdom. But for now, let's pray 
and then we'll take both the bread and then the cup. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, thank you for this communion time. Thank you for the fact that when you said paid in full, you paid our debt. And so now we want to be a people of the kingdom and say thank you for your grace. How thankful we are for your faithfulness. We receive this now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as our expression of saying yes, we will step over that line and be a people of the King. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and take the bread and then carefully pull back the second cover. You can take the cup. And when you're done, you can put it on the floor, but if you could take it with you when you exit and then put it in the receptacles on the outside, that would be great. Okay? Let's stand together as we conclude. We'll conclude with the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and uh, have a wonderful week, and we'll prepare our hearts for the next series that brings us all the way up to Easter, which is our one-year anniversary. Happy anniversary coming up, everybody. Great. And the three services. So what we're planning to do is our third service will be a video of the second service, so I don't... Uh, get laryngitis every week so we'll try that for a while and see how it goes but uh, we want to make room for more and more people that God is calling and so we'll all be a part of that but let's bow our heads father thank you so much for this communion Sunday and helping us to understand the whole sacrificial system and how you fulfilled the law through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ our Lord and how you've given us entry into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. Lord, we ask that you would help us to be a people grateful, people knowledgeable, whose hearts have been opened to understand the Word of God. And you did all of that for us. Thank you for embracing us. We embrace you and help us to embrace one another. Thank you for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. We say,